Hello, thank you for watching. I'm John Windsor Cunningham. The thing that's the most important thing about Shakespeare is is so extraordinary that it's 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 sort of difficult to say the word because it is only one word and it's the word which is absolutely the reason why we become actors uh, the most important thing about Shakespeare, what people really go to a Shakespeare production for, the thing which can possibly make a performance great, and certainly the thing which, whether you're Meryl Streep or Ian McKellen or me, or anyone, um, it's the one thing which can keep us really working at Shakespeare when we've lost track with what the hell some bits of the play are about, or whether it's really worth working on this particular production, as some very great actors have sometimes felt. Anyway, you want to know what the thing is, and I'm going to tell you. It's that in all Shakespeare's plays, in all the roles, in all the parts of the plays, he's always dealing with something that is an extreme. When each thinks the other is dead, they both commit suicide. In The Tempest, when Miranda falls in love, it's with the first man she's ever seen in her whole life, apart from her father. In Othello, he adores his wife, he thinks she's been unfaithful, he strangles her. In Macbeth, his ambition makes him assassinate a king. In Hamlet, the man who's murdered his father has married his mother. And the extremes continue in the comedies, in, in Two Gentlemen of Verona, Lance is extremely stupid. He thinks he's found someone whom even he thinks is stupid, and he lectures him and teaches him and corrects him with everything he thinks he's doing wrong, without seeming to realise that the person he's talking to is a dog. And by allowing ourselves to see, to some extent, to the extent that we can, to the extent that we dare explore, just how extreme these situation and these characters are, so much else in the plays becomes possible to interpret. Taking two examples, in Twelfth Night, Malvolio is clearly extremely pompous. He doesn't just love himself, he adores himself. In the middle of the play, he thinks the sight of his legs will be enough to make Olivia marry him. And he thinks everything he says is the mark of a genius. When C sees the letter M written on an envelope and works out that, after a while, that M could possibly stand for Malvolio, he feels like Einstein discovering that E equals MC squared. He's astonished at his brilliance. He is that extraordinary. And the more one can grasp that kind, that level of stupidity, of confidence, of whatever you want to call it, the better the character is. But at the beginning of the play and at the end of the play there are problems. In the opening scene he seems really, frankly I've always thought rather dull, dislikable, pompous for no reason, certainly not funny, and one wonders why Olivia has kept him on. And yet, once we know how pompous he's capable of being, it could be in the opening scene that he's holding his pomposity back. By his standards, he may be being quite polite to everyone, even very polite, and he may think that everything he says is so brilliant. So for the actor playing the role, it's a fantastically successful, successful scene, and that will make it feel so for the audience and the actors around him. Let's go to the end of the play with Malvolio. Malvolio, Malvolio at the end of the play. He's been tortured and ridiculed and locked up by Festi, and he marches off at the end saying, I'll be revenged on the whole pack of you. And he's not been apologised to by anyone. And generally people feel that Malvolio is treated rather badly and that um, he must have been really terrible. And this is a dark ending for that part of the play. But Shakespeare doesn't have dark endings for characters in comedies, does he? At any rate, when we look at the middle of the play and realise how confident Malvolio is capable of being. Surely it's possible that when he says, I'll be revenged on the whole pack of you, that he's quite confident of having his revenge on them. He doesn't think about it for long because then he thinks of something else. He's not going to come back and shoot them all. But, but he, he does feel completely happy as he goes off. Very confident, I think. The ending isn't dark at all for Malvolio. It's as happy for him as it is for anyone, even though he walks off on his own. That's what's funny. Anyway, it's extremes that will bring one round to considering that option. And taking another play, let's look at Romeo and Juliet. Juliet's father, 
flies into what has to be called an extreme rage. He is going to throw Juliet out in the street with no food, no money, and never talk to her again. When she tells him she won't marry the man that he's chosen for her. His rage is extraordinary. His own wife thinks he's gone mad. Because, it seems, his daughter won't marry the man of his choice. But earlier on in the play, he said openly that he thinks Juliet's too young to marry, by two years. So she's too young then, and now he's going mad about this. How do we sort these things out? Now, it can be that in the earlier scene, he's really wanting to be in charge of everything Juliet does. He's really a horrible man who loses his temper. And earlier on, he says, you know, she's too young and he's being very curt about it. But it doesn't sound curt when he says it. And anyway, let's look at the extreme. When he loses his temper later on, Juliet hasn't just refused to marry the man he wants her to have, but she doesn't explain she won't say why. She can't tell him she's already married Romeo, and he can't possibly guess. And so to him, it just seems incredibly odd, rude, contemptuous, meaningless, just flying in the face of everything he's expected from her. And he goes mad. And at the beginning of the play, when he doesn't want her to leave to marry anyone for two years, it may well be that he just doesn't want her to leave. She's his only happiness. He can't bear the idea of being without her. But then he thinks it about a bit more and thinks, well, of course, she has to leave. I mustn't be selfish. Yes, I'll let her marry. Here's the man. And when he goes through that and she says no, then one can work it all out. But there's a certain logic to it. Um, Mel Gibson, Mel Gibson, Marcellus. And I mention this only because... The smallest scenes, the smallest parts in the play, even if they don't have any lines at all, will be going through something. People may not know in the audience, but it's enough for the actor to play them. And Marcellus, at the beginning of Hamlet, is often thought just to be a guard waiting there before Hamlet comes on to fill out the stage a bit. I really, I think he's often thought to be no better apart than that. But Gibson played him a year before he played Hamlet for the first time in Australia, and Gibson will have known that when a soldier is waiting on guard, even though he knows, as Marcellus knows, that he may be attacked by an enemy any moment, like enemies um, in Iraq today when American soldiers are on, on parade, they look completely relaxed. They don't look as relaxed as if they were waiting for a bus. The stuff going on inside, they don't, as Marcellus shouldn't, in that scene, upstage Hamlet by being so scared. Gibson won't have done that, but he'll have known what Marcellus is going through. He'll also have known that it's Marcellus who's seen the ghost of Hamlet's father two nights before at this particular hour, and so must be expecting him again. And for, for Marcellus, this is the scariest night of his life. So to say it's the scariest night of his life of a role. And when any of us think, if we can, of the scariest time we've ever had, and if that was extreme, it was the scariest we've had. But was it extreme? Have we experienced or given anything like extreme love? Well, there'll be something we've done that's extreme. Anyway, how we get into these emotions and things isn't the point. The point is that we go for as much as we can and all the roles are exploring something extreme, so we mustn't forget the fact. It's what we become actors for, to be extremely brave, to be extremely cruel, to be extremely sad, and to love someone extremely. It must be what we become actors for. Thank you very much for watching.